for the past um, for the past 15 years or so, our society has become increasingly online, and and we've been experimenting with the wonderful democratic effects of that. I'll tell you about the problem whilst we get set up here, and and. The problem really is that those with a slightly different agenda, a different agenda than the democratic benefits of the internet, have systematically infiltrated our computer infrastructure to the point where it's actually reasonable to ask whether we face a massive societal risk as a result. So today I'm gonna to tell you about a very simple little thing, which is how we can make a computer system behave a little bit more like you and make the internet a vastly safer place. So to start off, let me introduce two very special people, my children, uh, Oliver and Eastland. And they are like your children or your grandchildren or friends or whatever, immensely creative, brave beyond words. You love them like anything, love them to bits. They are imaginative, they could do anything. <laughs> they have ambitions vastly superior to their abilities. <laughs> and like you, and like me, they make mistakes. <laughs> and of course you realize that was a little bit of a stunt at the beginning of this when you saw my PayPal account up there. So don't go and try and pull the money out of it. I did that just before I helped on stage. <laughs> What's really important to take away from this is that creativity and love and companionship are all dependent on one crucial thing, and that is trust. Trust is fundamental to every relationship that we have, whether it be your lover or your friends or the cab driver who brought you over here. Trust is fundamental to everything of value to humans. And within a trustful environment, we can be incredibly creative. All of these wonderful juices that we bring to the fore can be celebrated and can deliver and fulfill their potential. And so it's worthwhile exploring trust. Where does it come from? What is the origin of this thing called trust, and why do we have it? What's the basis? It turns out from research that, that trust is fundamental to our human nature and played a fundamentally important role in the development of human cognitive um, abilities. Because the moment you have to do something bigger than just you, any capability that requires more than one person, you are fundamentally dependent on another. And the moment that you're dependent on somebody else, you are vulnerable. And so trust is a crucial ingredient of any interaction between any two people. In fact, without trust, we're totally lost. Trust, therefore, plays a fundamental role in the building of society, whether it be an Amish barn raising, or whether it be some modern activity that you might participate in every day. Trust is what makes us human. Because with trust, we can be creative and we can fulfill our own innate potential. And TED is all about that. TED is all about fulfilling your potential to deliver your incredible talents to the world. We have a strange human propensity to trust things that we shouldn't. For example, my trusty 66 Chevy. I kind of believe it's going to get me there on time. But science might tell me differently. I mean, this is somewhere where definitely a domain of science could go and figure out whether or not the car will get me to the church on time, as it were. And so more of this later, but I want to park this thought in your head right now about the idea that we as humans who are so founded around this notion of trust can occasionally make mistakes in terms of trust here specifically talking about bits of machinery. So if trust is wonderful and allows us to be human and creative and to deliver value, what is the lack of trust? The lack of trust disempowers us. When we are afraid, 
we withdraw because when we are not in a trusting environment, we cannot create. We are vulnerable to the whim of another. Trust is required because in the context of a relationship between any two people, we rely on the goodwill of that other person to bring their competence into that relationship so that we can both succeed. And so the lack of trust means that we cannot create. It means that we cannot fulfill who we are. And indeed, in societies that are ruled by fear, there tends to be oppression and people cannot create and they cannot fulfill their destiny. Indeed, so much so that, that there is a lot of research that demonstrates that torture is literally the absence of trust. Torturing an individual is the business of destroying all trust in the world to the point that it destroys the individual. So, part of my job as a parent, in fact, my only job as a parent, is to get my kids through, right? I want to get them there alive. And I want to tell you two ways that we could do it. The one, which I show here, is that I could put them in a bubble. Right? <laughs> we had this natural idea, it's like, oh yeah, I've got to get you to the point where you're 18 or 21, so I'm going to put you in a bubble. I know you'll be safe there. I know you'll be safe. And so that's the traditional mode of defense. That's how we as humans have always defended ourselves, get back in a bubble, or as a society, get back behind some big walls. So another way to think this is I could say, well, I'll put my kids in, in their bedrooms, and I know that I can get them to their 18th birthday that way. I know I can do it. My wife might hate me, but I guarantee you I can get two living individuals out of that process. Is that a good idea? That's the question. Is that something we want to do? You see, we can, fitness for, for life is not about survival. It's about being able to go out and fulfill your potential. So I would definitely not get two individuals who are ready for the planet out of their bedrooms at the age of 18. And so there's a real problem here. How do we, how do we look after things that we value? What is the process by which we raise our children, raise these kids up to a more mature age, so that they can properly engage with the world? And it's not trust, by the way. It's not just simple trust. So the first way was actually very, very reminiscent of the ancient city of Troy. You see a society under siege for 10 years. What can we say about it? They ate lousy food and they drank horrible wine. It probably tasted like vinegar. But as a society, they were not productive because siege mentality said you can't go outside the city. The Greeks were having a blast. They were on the beach too. But the city of Troy had siege mentality. And what else can we say about the city of Troy? Eventually, the bad guys got in. In what vehicle did they get in? Well, probably someone like my daughter, Islin, let them in because she said, God, what a beautiful pony. <laughs> you see, the American Constitution has these wonderful words in it around life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty being absolutely crucial here. The pursuit of happiness being drawn from the Roman notion of fulfillment of an individual as a civic virtue. Happiness being a civic virtue, fulfillment. So we definitely can't adopt the model, which is the model of the city of Troy, or the model of putting them in a bubble. That will not get productive members of society to the fore by the time they're ready to engage. So what are we to do? Well, it turns out that we do something very interesting. As humans, we cannot define good or bad. You see, what's good for me is not necessarily good for you. And we teach our children something which is a variance on this concept of trust. And I'm going to illustrate this by telling you exactly what happened as I was showing my son Oliver this presentation on the flight over here. We were flipping through it, and I told him, oh, this presentation, it's all about you. And he was happy as a clam. And then he said, Gurrah! ice creams. I want an ice cream. And all I did was click the slide, see. And then he said, really? Is that an ice cream truck? 
And so what he did right there and then was he exhibited something which is an innate property of all of us, relative trust, relative trust. Every single one of us from the moment we are born has an ability to respond to intricate cues of our environment to apply rules of relative trust. Is that an ice cream van that you really want to buy an ice cream from? No, it really isn't. So relative trust, <laughs> relative trust actually, when we're born, we, we have to trust what's around us. We have to trust the people who feed us. We have to believe what they say. And so our children start to pick up all of our own biases and, and a whole bunch of other things, but they become relatively trust, trustful or distrustful based on those. By the way, it's very interesting. As a consequence of this, think about this one. You, you could find a child who believes in God but not in Harry Potter. And there's no evidence for either. I mean, they both come in books and so on, but, but you see? Okay. So relative trust is the process by which we begin to believe things. And it's very, very important to our societal evolution. I'm going to try and give you a couple of other examples of relative trust and get you more engaged in that just for a second. Everybody's heard of WikiLeaks, goodness me. And the, the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, is certainly a fairly controversial figure. Within each one of you here in the audience right now, that is evoking <coughs> some passion of some sort, like, yay, good for you, or traitor. One of the two, see? That's relative trust. You have your own biases. I'm not going to try and find out which ones they are. Here's another person right next to him, Hillary Clinton. You know, people thinking, oh, she might be a candidate for the next president, you know, after Barack Obama in the United States. Certainly appears to be less controversial than Mr. Assange, but it is provable from WikiLeaks that Hillary Clinton ordered UN delegates from the US to spy on the delegates of other countries at the UN. And I've been in there, and I've seen the consequence of that. So it's very, very interesting. Trust is related to information. It's related to what you believe and a whole bunch of things. Let's try one more. Everybody has a Facebook account, right? Hands up if you don't. <laughs> there you go. Now, who puts photographs up on Facebook? OK, good. Who puts photographs of your kids on Facebook? Relatively few. Would you ever put your credit card information <laughs> up on Facebook? OK. You see, you're displaying this notion of relative trust, which is really based on an, an amazing calculus which happens within you, just in terms of observed failures and various other things. OK, you get this idea, relative trust. It's how we as humans conduct our lives. Because in every situation in which we find ourselves, every single day, on the street, we are at risk. We live always at risk. And so relative trust allows us to very quickly decide on how we should respond, how we should respond in any situation. There's a perfect uh, quotation from E.L. Doctorow which summarizes everything about relative trust, and I absolutely love this. It's like driving a car at night. You can see only as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole trip this way. Right? You can make the whole trip this way. Now, we live in this online domain nowadays. And that brings us to some challenges. Because in the online domain, none of the social cues that we would normally drive our machinery for relative trust off is actually valid. It doesn't work. It's a very uh, stimulus impoverished environment. And our computer systems are worse than us at trying to decide whether something is good or bad. In fact, they're downright pathetic at it. And we've been trying this notion of detecting bad guys on our computer systems for over two decades with woeful results, woeful, woeful results. And I'm going, to try and I'm going to try and demonstrate that to you now very quickly. If you're like me, you stumble out of bed in the morning, I try and do it just before the kids, hop downstairs, make a cup of tea, and go and see what's on Twitter. So let's do that. Let's go and see what's on Twitter. Oh, look, I have a new direct message. See the one with the blue dot? from my friend, Bromite, who I work with. Let's see what he has to say. Click on the link, OK? You see, all I did was click on a link in Twitter, and whoa, something's happening. He's, he's writing a new application, this chap. And I was had 
You see, with the, with the benefit of modern tools, I can show you that within an instant, within a couple of seconds of clicking on any link in Twitter, I was had. My computer reached out to various servers in Asia and around the planet, all of which had been compromised, and the bad guy was on my computer system stealing my stuff. Okay. And nobody has any idea that that's the case. What do we have? We have a tweet shrunk URL, some bunch of characters which nobody could ever be expected to decide is good or bad. Your computer system can never make any assertion about that. And who's the bad guy here? Who's the bad guy? This is my friend who I work with. His name is Don. He sent me the tweet. He had a bad password on his Twitter account. And so he's the bad guy. <laughs> hmm. So let's just go through this then. On computer systems, there are several things at work here. I am gullible, just like you. And I will make a mistake, just like I made a mistake leaving my PayPal account up on the screen. But the person who wrote all the code on your computer system is fallible, just another human. There are about 100 million lines of code on your computer system, even on your smartphone. It's millions and millions and millions of lines of code. And what we know is that fallible humans leave lots of bugs in their code, which is why systems fail. And so the bad guy will always get in. Always get in. The bad guy will always get in. This idea that you could detect bad and stop it is in entirely fallacious. Let me show you. How, here's a cool stunt. You want to charm your friends? Here's how I did the Twitter attack. Go to a little website called malwaredomains.com. Copy a fun-looking URL. Just do that. Okay, so just copy any one of them. By the way, I do this out of, out of Dropbox, too. Go to bit.ly, compress the URL. See? Take that compressed URL and just go to a compromised Twitter account and type it in with something that looks relatively interesting and hit send. And that's all you do. And then you're in the malware business too. <laughs> okay. So it's very easy to fool computer systems. Okay? This is state-of-the-art computer systems here, not, not, not old stuff. These are the things we deal with every day. So what are we going to do in terms of trying to solve this problem? The problem really is that in the world of trust, you can never tell whether you're going to surf with a dolphin or a shark. Okay? You just don't know what's going on out there. And by the way, that's exactly the same as when you cross the street or when you, you're about to jump into a cab and somebody else runs and jumps into the cab ahead of you. Was that a dolphin or a shark? It's something else. There was a relationship there for a moment and you have no knowledge beforehand. But your machinery for relative trust generally saves you in the big outside world. Okay? So we have to get back there. Because actually, when it is a shark, it's pretty bad. Right? It's pretty bad. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in Western society is we believe that the bad guy is just a spotty-nosed kid you know, coming home from school, the board, so they hack a couple of computers. It is not that by any means. Every single large enterprise in the US, for sure, has been taken. Right? We are all in the US paying taxes to fund the F-35 plane development. The F-35 plane, the plans have already been stolen. Right? They're gone. So it's very, very, very serious and very organized. And there are people who are trying to do this actively. And they know that you and I are gullible. And they know that our code is fallible. And they know that we can never detect them. So what are we to do? This is rather bad. It turns out that the right thing to do is relative trust. So now I'm going to get you to imagine your world as cake. It turns out that there are a couple of instructions available on the CPU of every computer system that are unused, that we can actually take advantage of to do something totally amazing. We can translate this concept of human relative trust into something called least privilege. And we can get a computer system to do what it does well, which is run a few very simple rules, to transform its behavior from being something which is totally stupid and dumb and, and, and well, fun, but, but not protect you, into something which flawlessly executes the rules of least privilege. So look at your life as though it's a, piece, it's a big cake. 
And in general, if your computer system or your smartphone is like mine, it's full of all sorts of stuff, right? My work, my life, my stuff. It's all there. It's all mished up. It's a big mush. And so today, you can have your cake, but somebody else is going to eat it. At some point, somebody else will eat it. The goal is to provide you a mechanism for defending your cake, no matter what. So we're going to do, do a little bit of surgery on the cake. And I'm going to let you keep all of your stuff, which is still on the top, all the toppings. You like the toppings. We're going to put a slightly different kind of cake there for people who I'm going to share cake with. So in any interaction, whenever my computer system talks to another computer system, whenever it opens a URL, whenever it opens a document or file from a USB stick or, or anything like that, we're going to go into that sharing zone. And the, the cake there is unadorned. Unadorned in the sense that nothing that I care about is in that world. See, I only care about the toppings, like you. So, here we go. Let's try this. When I, oh, I almost forgot the most important part. How do we do this? We do this with the aid of a small body of open source software called Zen. Zen is a hypervisor, technically. It's been created by hundreds of people, thousands of people worldwide. And it runs the infrastructure at Amazon Web Services and it does a bunch of other cool things besides. But this small body of code, and I mean 100,000 lines of code, meticulously maintained by an open source community and made freely available to everybody, has an ability to deliver this concept of relative trust to your computer system without changing its behavior in any way, just by taking advantage of a few extra CPU instructions. So here we go. When I go to Facebook, what files do I need in my file system? Pretty clearly, only one. I need the cookie for the site facebook.com. What network do I need access to? I need access only to the World Wide Web, the untrusted World Wide Web. So even if I was sitting at work, we should never ever send a packet on my work network or to my trusted sites, like my banking site or some, some site that my company uses as a SaaS application. So we can put the adornment of those two pieces of into that piece of cake, and bang, we're in a place where we can now share with Facebook, and then it's okay if the bad guy shows up, because all he could steal is that. By the same notion, if I go to Twitter, the only thing I need is the cookie for twitter.com and the untrusted World Wide Web. And so, if I lose something, if the bad guy gets into that context, it's just the context that envelops that communication, that transaction and I lose a little piece of cake. But it's cake that I decided I would share anyway, and it's not particularly valuable to me. See, it's not the chocolate cake, and it doesn't have any of the toppings on the top. <laughs> so this principle of essentially translating relative trust into a way that a computer system can execute it, and execute it flawlessly, because anything from the outside of my computer system is innately untrustworthy and must be treated as that, is very, very straightforward to do on a computer system. The code base is there. It's in open source, and there's an ecosystem starting to develop it. So the good news is this, that I'm confident that the next generation of computer systems will have an ability to protect you in the way that you protect yourself, by being a little bit more like you, by bringing relative trust, which in implementation terms is called least privilege, uh, onto your computer system. So I'm going to just translate it once more into a slightly different way of thinking about the world. You see, we're going into this online world, and increasingly in the future, we as humans will be immersed in a digital reality. So imagine now you're the goldfish. I give you two options for how to be in a tank. Right? One is that I have to put a bubble around you, like I put a bubble around Oliver and Eastland. And then you look at the world, and you can't really partake of it because I have to protect you at all times. By the way, this is how companies run their computer networks today. You can't use Twitter, you can't use Facebook, you can't use this application, you can't do that. Because we have this mentality from the city of Troy. The other way to do it is to put everything else into bubbles. Whenever anybody interacts with you, you put them in a bubble. Right? <laughs> now, the good thing about this is that you're still the goldfish, you get the whole tank. right? And you get to be out there and be you. And that's the most important thing about this. Remember, let's go back to this concept of trust. In our lives, everything is about trust, right? Trust is what makes us successful as people. It's what makes us fulfilled as individuals. If you go back to my, 
my beautiful little experiment, which is my family trust is what makes that thing hum. And so if you are trusting, if you can trust your devices, if you can trust the computer systems that you use and the networks that you're on, then you have an opportunity to be creative without fear. We have an opportunity to take humanity into this digital age in a way which will guarantee our safety online. Thank you.